Over the last decade and a half, fracking in the United States has grown exponentially. In 2000, fracking only made up 2% of America's oil production. Now, it makes up over 50%. Of all of the ways we source our energy, fracking is the most controversial. It's dominated politics. You, my, you, answer, my answer is a lot shorter. No, I do not support fracking. It's impacted the media. Earthquake that rattled much of the heartland, striking in Oklahoma as a meteorologist was on the air. A powerful earthquake rattled central Oklahoma Saturday. But fracking has had its biggest impact on people's lives. The fracking process has tainted people's water supplies, contaminated rivers, and has even caused a massive spike in seismic activity. In 2015, Oklahoma averaged two and a half earthquakes a day with a magnitude of 3.0 or higher. A total of 907 at that rating shook the state last year compared to just two in 2008. Oklahoma Geological Survey experts have connected the increase in quakes to the disposal of wastewater from an oil and gas production process known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking. But what exactly is fracking, and why is it causing seismic activity and groundwater to become contaminated? As our demand for fossil fuels has grown, we've exhausted many of our large deposits of oil, shale, and natural gas. But over time, it became harder and harder to find these larger deposits, so energy prices steadily increased. This made the once unprofitable fracking a profitable form of extracting oil and natural gas. The fracking process begins with a vertical shaft being drilled several thousand feet into the earth. At some point, horizontal drilling begins at the depth that the gas bearing layer is thought to be. Then, the hydraulic fluid is pumped into the ground with pumps. About 8 million liters or 2.1 million gallons of water is pumped into the ground, which is equivalent to about the daily water usage of about 65,000 people. Sand and a concoction of chemicals are also included in this mixture. The intense pressure of this mixture produces millions of tiny cracks in the rock. The sand prevents these cracks from closing back up again. The chemicals in the mixture are designed to compress the water, kill off bacteria, and dissolve the minerals. Now, the natural gas can be recovered from the rock. Once there is no more gas in the well, the drill hole is sealed and the fracking fluid is pumped back into the well and sealed. This aspect of fracking produces the most controversy. The chemical water mixture has to be pumped back into the earth and cannot be stored above ground. Many see this as a risk to contaminate drinking water. Fracking not only requires both fresh water in its mixture, but after the process is completed, the toxic water cannot even be treated in a treatment plant. Despite this known danger, several water sources in the United States have been contaminated due to negligence. But as the amount of fracking increases in Pennsylvania, can we expect to see the same level of seismic activity that has plagued the people in Oklahoma? Is our water in danger of becoming contaminated? We spoke to one of the preeminent fracking experts in the country to learn more. I'm a Texas A&M PhD where I studied brutal fracture of rock. And my main interest is the splitting of rock naturally under pressure from um, oil and gas, among other things. And that expertise led to an interest in gas shales. And that interest then led to a uh, prediction on how much gas there was in the Marcellus. The Marcellus Shale Formation is one of the largest in the country. Dr. Engelder has conducted extensive research on it over the years and has even given many talks on the subject, including one here at Penn State during the annual TEDx conference. In Oklahoma right now, there are a lot of earthquakes that are caused by the injection of produced water. It has nothing to do with splitting rocks uh, in terms of recovering hydrocarbons, but uh, just because the water is being injected after separating water from oil, then that's caused these problems that, that um, are, have been labeled fracking. 
In late February, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection released a statement and presentation outlining the proven link between fracking in Pennsylvania and subsequent earthquakes. In the Lawrence County event, is properly classified as an induced tectonic seismic event. This is how the DEP rolled out its big announcement, a webinar only a geologist could love. Lots of science talk, slides, no faces. We found the guy behind the PowerPoint and drilled down for an English translation. And we found a connection between oil and gas activities and these detected seismic events, essentially earthquakes. Last April in Lawrence County on the Ohio border, five small earthquakes caused by fracking in the Utica Shale. But can the same amount of seismic activity that has occurred in Oklahoma occur here in Pennsylvania? No, I don't. Uh, and, and the reason for that largely is that Pennsylvania has very few disposal wells and it's the disposal wells that are largely the, the culprit in causing these, uh, this, this abundant earthquake activity. Um, the rocks in Pennsylvania are just not quite right for disposal and so the earthquakes in Oklahoma are unique for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the right geology is found there and it, it's just not, not present in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania producers are reusing a lot of the water that comes back in, in flow back so that it can be recycled uh, as opposed to just plain being pumped into the ground. There's multiple contributing factors and they almost have to arrive in a certain combination to trigger an event. An earthquake blamed on drilling is a first in PA. The industry points out more than 7,000 wells have been drilled in the Commonwealth and called those quakes isolated and exceptionally rare. It's the kind of activity that should not be allowed to move forward at this point because we know that it's not safe. Sierra Club PA insists fracking endangers drinking water and now this. One more evidence that fracking poses threats to our communities and we need to think very seriously about the kind of energy future that we want here in Pennsylvania. Well, contamination of water has become a great concern for the average person and, and it is the contamination or perceived contamination that has caused the international pushback against fracking. Largely what happened was that drillers in Pennsylvania penetrated the top two or three thousand feet of rock here in Pennsylvania without realizing that layer after layer after layer contained methane gas. And the early drillers didn't take proper precautions to stop this gas from flowing into groundwater so that, that the gas methane appeared in groundwater and in larger quantities than the public realized or the public had. Now, the important fact uh, is that methane is not poisonous. It is a fact that people drink methane dissolved in groundwater and they're drinking water all the time. They don't even know it's happening. The only concern about methane is that if it gets concentrated in enclosed spaces like cellars, under some circumstances it can be explosive. So contamination then even that is a relative term. It's, uh, it is true that, that in some instances, methane ended up being concentrated more in groundwater than it had been before. Debates in communities around the country have sparked discussion on whether or not fracking should be regulated. Dr. Engelder argues that further regulations on fracking are most effective on the state level. Well, the argument is that the state agencies are set up to take into account the local circumstances. Texas is dry, Pennsylvania is wet, for example. Texas is hot, Pennsylvania is cold. And so there's a different set of regulations that operate um, at, in, in these two geographic locations. And there are, uh, there, there is no single formula where one equation fits all of these situations. And there are, um, there, there are national rules. Uh, civil rights, for example, was one of these things that was really critical that the federal government stepped in and uh, took over and, and led the way. 
I, um, I don't think that regulating hydraulic fracturing, however, is at the level of need that the civil rights movement was at in the 1960s when the Johnson administration just plain put its foot down and said, we're going to do things differently from now moving forward. 2016 saw significant changes for the future of fracking in Pennsylvania. In June, Governor Wolf signed 12 bills into law which dealt with greater regulation of the fracking industry and focused on protecting water supplies, public lands, and the environment. In July 2016, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled on several parts of Act 13 of Robinson v. Commonwealth, a controversial ruling on the state's gas laws. According to NPR, changes to Act 13 included striking down the Dr. Gag rule, which prohibited doctors from disclosing the full list of chemicals affecting patients in fracking-related accidents, and declaring that both eminent domain for natural gas storage facilities and the exclusion of private wells from notification hazardous spills is unconstitutional. In October 2016, the state of Pennsylvania passed additional regulations on fracking, the first set of changes to the rules since the industry started over a decade earlier. The legislation faced heavy opposition from oil companies and gas companies. The new regulations required additional precautions to be taken around public resources, including water supplies, which drillers are now required to restore if they sustain damage during the fracking process. I'm not sure that there's much need for additional uh, regulations right now from legislation. Now, uh, let me remind you that, that agencies are set up in Pennsylvania, for example, it took legislation to set up the Department of Environmental Protection. But once the Department of Environmental Protection was given a license, part of that license was they were told to identify the necessary regulations to keep the public safe. Well, hydraulic fracturing will continue, uh, largely because there will be a demand for natural gas for a number of products, not the least of which is plastics, for example. And um, the reality is that even as we move forward into an age where we rely more and more on renewables like wind and solar, both of these two renewable sources of energy are intermittent. And the public, you and me, demand that we be able to turn our lights on 24-7. And so when the wind doesn't blow and the sun is not shining, there needs to be a backup plan for generating electricity.